Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. If you're wondering why I am wearing a birthday hat today, it is Canada's birthday, but that is not why. It is also the birthday of a very special dear friend of mine who saved the day by filling in today on our podcast, but I've always wanted to have him come back because he's been on before. You guys loved him. Actually, we first met on this podcast many, many years ago. He is somebody that you all know and love, the one and only Mike Quasar. Hi. Happy birthday to you. Uh, Happy birthday to uh, you. Happy birthday, a, dear I have, Mike. I have a hat too, but I don't want to fuck up Happy my hair. Happy birthday to <clears throat> you. Thank you. Thank you. I, not And how else would I rather spend my, my special day than doing a <laughs> podcast with you? And your cleavage. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, today's podcast is brought to you by my cleavage, yeah, yeah. which you can only see if you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Um, if you're listening to this on an audio podcast, well, you're just going to have to imagine. But let me tell you, folks, it looks fabulous. Can I narrate for those who might just be listening? Yes, <laughs> please right. do. Uh, Holly Randall today is sitting in a chair that's uh, like kind of a royal blue. She's contrasted with a white uh, linen type dress. Her uh, very, very ample bosom is on full display. Good <laughs> Lord. It, almost you could imagine a little bit of oil splashed on them. It would be a fantasy <laughs> come to life right here in Wilden Hills, <laughs> California, ladies and gentlemen. And I return the show back to her. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. You know, Mike, this is going to get a real a lot of views. Um, <laughs> well, I, it's certainly not going to get a lot of views because I'm sitting here. So let's talk about your tits as much as possible. I yes, think. Yeah. I know. What I I don't think I can wear this hat anymore because it feels very silly. Yeah. What no, it is. It's this? quite. Yeah. No, that's distracting. Actually, <laughs> you're. I mean. It's Madonna, 1987. It's yeah. Nice. For like those that. of you who are not watching the video, I am putting two birthday hats on my boobs like nipples. But. For those of you listening on Spotify, Holly has a purple and green party hat over each breast. <laughs> very, very erotic. All right. We're going to put these hats to the side. Okay. I just wanted to wish you a happy birthday. Thank you very much. And can you believe that the first time we met was on this podcast? You were like one of my very first episodes, like episode four, I think, or something. Uh, yeah, it was very, very early on, and I don't remember how that happened, but... Uh, Actually, I do. Do you know okay. who recommended that I have you on my show? I do not. Stormy Daniels. Provocative. All right. Yes. Look at that. And who yes. knew that years later, we'd be talking about Stormy <laughs> Daniels for entirely different reasons. So uh, I know, <laughs> and that the rest of the world would know her name yes. for entirely different reasons. Yes, Yes. So that's pretty wild, huh? It's a little strange. Yeah. And uh, yeah. All right. Well, that was very kind of Stormy. Thank you, Stormy, if you're watching. Uh, I think a lifelong friendship was made that day. So here we Thank are. Thank you, Stormy. We owe you so much, Stormy. Yes, absolutely. Including my friendship with Mike. Yeah. But I am, um, I do love you dearly and we've become very good friends. Yes, we have. And um, Hence why I'm here on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Not like I had anything to celebrate, really. I mean... <laughs> We're here to celebrate you. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So tell me um, what you were doing on your very special day today, besides the honor of appearing on my podcast. Which is, in fact, an honor, just so anyone, don't kid yourself. This is a thrill. When she said, are you doing anything tomorrow? And I was like, oh, God, I guess I can help you. But really, I have uh, I have no greater honor than being on Holly Randall's podcast. So having said that, I woke up this morning. I enjoyed three cups of coffee from my Nespresso machine, which was uh, donated to me by my other very good friend, Julianne. And I walked my dog, who's now almost as old as me, and uh, took a shower and came here. How old are you today, by the way? I'm, I'd rather not discuss, a lady never discusses such things. <laughs> You're like 70 yeah, or something, yeah, right? No, here's Are the you thing. as old as Biden or are you older? Uh, uh, for, first of all, <laughs> a couple of things, I got, I beat Medicare. No, I'm not as old as, uh, no one's as old as Biden, but I'm, I'm very old. I'm very old. Oh, God. Well, we will get actually, even though I, I generally try not to talk politics, I think that this election year, like, mm. we have to. It's kind of important. Mm. And there's a question for you about politics mm, Jesus from Christ. one of the Patreon members later. So we'll we'll get into that later. <laughs> Nothing unites people like politics. That's what I like to say. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about your life today. Okay. What is like a big thing that happened in like the last year and a half for you? Hmm, the last year and a half. Uh, hmm, well, I uh, got a new dining room table. I don't mm. know if that's exciting to your listeners. Oh, that but, is uh, exciting. Mahogany. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I live in a very modest condo, so I'm proud of the table. Uh, oh, I stopped drinking. <laughs> I totally forgot. I don't, uh, yeah, I gave up booze. Can you imagine that? What's up with that? That yeah. is, um, yeah. spoiler alert, I knew that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Uh, that is incredible. Why don't you tell us in your own words about your sobriety journey and why you stopped drinking. Okay. Well, if this is in fact interesting to anybody, uh, I will tell you that from about the age of, and it's funny because I, um, sort of a, um, uh, very uh, prolific, at least in terms of my own journaling to myself, a prolific writer. So I have documented proof of the very first time I acknowledged that I might've had a problem with alcohol and it was, uh, October 10th, 1995. So I was 25. I just gave my age away. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but no and, one's going to uh, do math. Let's yeah. be real. <laughs> like, holy shit. I, was, I hope the guy was going to say he was 72. I'd say he looks pretty good for his age. <laughs> Spoiler alert. I don't. Anyway. Uh, so I wrote uh, uh, on that particular fateful uh, day that I thought I might have a problem with alcohol. And, but it took me uh, almost 30 more years to actually do anything about it. So, um, and, uh, and you were a, a large part of that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 very strange how I started drinking for you know whatever reasons I had back then. Those can't possibly be the same reason that I continued all those years. But I it just become it became a part of my life. It became a part of my personality. It became a part of my persona. It was like a thing where everybody's like, "Oh, it's Quasar. He's drinking." Blah blah blah. He's you know blah blah blah. I used to do stand up comedy years ago. Most of my act was about my drinking problem. I used to make a joke about the fact that. Uh, you always hear about these poor desperate alcoholics that are on the waiting list for a new liver. That's why I'm putting myself on the list now because uh, I want that liver waiting for me, you know? Uh, as it turns out, I might not need one, so that's good. Um, uh, no, I've been to rehab twice. Um, I was probably, now that we have to go through all of our steps and our inventory and everything, I was probably a terrible husband and I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, not like I was, Isn't yeah. it crazy how that stuff works? Crazy how that when stuff you start works. like really looking at your yeah. part, you're like, oh. yeah, I don't want, yeah, that part's, uh, I might go back to drinking actually, if I think about that too much, but, <laughs> uh, whole fucking inventory thing. But, uh, I don't know. I can't even tell you why a moment came where I'm like, this is it. I can't, my doctor had told me years ago, you're going to die. And I'm like, eh, whatever. Many people in my life, including you, uh, were probably very, um, subtly, moving me in that direction. Like, you know, things are not going to always, you know, anyway, long story short, I was, um, coming off uh, yet another bender. Somehow I managed to shoot more porn than anyone who ever lived during this entire, I think it's good that I had this as a vocation. Cause I don't think you can be a, uh, a neurosurgeon and have that degree of uh, dependency on alcohol, but I, uh, <laughs> there's no expectations in this business. So I, I excelled anyway. Uh, you too can be a degenerate alcoholic and still make a decent living for your family and your children. Okay. Uh, so I, I was on yet another vendor, uh, the 40,000th of my life. And um, I just was like, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't every moment of every day is either thinking about drinking, um, wishing I was drinking, <laughs> uh, detoxing from not drinking enough. Um, there's this constant state of anxiety that you find yourself in. And again, it just sort of becomes part of your life. So you don't really realize it. And then for some reason, they always make that joke. You know, I had a moment of clarity. Uh, it may have also helped that I was um, I was so uh, out of whack that I was detoxing using uh, gabapentin that was prescribed to my dog. That's how I got off alcohol, just so you know. You were taking your dog's gabapentin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how many gabapentin do you have to take to for it to be like human size? Do you just look know. at your dog and figure like, ah, there's like the three of me in there. The dog's about 70 pounds. I'm about 160, 175. I'm going to go, uh, I'm doing six. That was <laughs> it. I uh, I went to WebMD. I had it all figured out. What's the problem? Um, so anyway, I was doing my, I was doing about six of those a day. And, um, and then by like the third day, I started to feel kind of normal. And uh, I believe it was uh, you. It's all kind of foggy, but I think you were like a, uh, we should go to a meeting, Mike. And I went, uh, fuck. Yeah, all right. And we did. <laughs> and uh, just like they say, I kept coming back. And now it's 14 months later. And um, man, that's, I can't, I'll get emotional. 
so I'm going to stop. No, but I, you should. No, you should. We, have a, t- we have tissues right I'm at, I, like I'm, no, at, I'm at a I'm I'm at a share meeting right now. I'm like yeah. And then I remember I woke up in a pool of my own urine, and my <laughs> my dog looked at me strangely, and I wondered. I hope I didn't touch her. And anyway, no, none of that ever happened. It was. Nothing strange. I just had a very serious dependency on it. I don't know why you just reminded me of that story of that one speaker that we saw who like woke up like car- like he was masturbating with like motor oil. Oh, motor oil. That was the craziest <laughs> fucking story, man. That's the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous, aside from the help that it gives you and you can really have a new life. And I recommend it. I don't push it, but I recommend it for anybody. But the fucking stories, man, it's like, you know, you think you have a rock button. This motherfucker was jerking off on meth, drunk out of his mind with fucking motor oil. <laughs> Somewhere out in the desert, I'm like, whoa, okay. That was, I think, no, he was parked like on a bridge yeah. above where they were shooting like Pirates um, yeah, of the Caribbean they, they, or yeah, something, they were right? The movie. Yeah, and he was just like, oh, I'm going to check out this film shoot. And then he just got fucked up on drugs and alcohol and just started I'm jerking off. From, and I got nothing to use. So I just reached around. I got some, uh, <laughs> you know, 10W30. And uh, I'm like, huh. And the, all, all I'm thinking is, you, you, you should have used a synthetic. You know, that would have been better for you. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> Everybody knows you don't put, uh, you know, regular <laughs> motor oil in a car. Um, anyway, so that was, uh, yeah. So I never did that. I never jerked off with uh, motor oil um, uh, ever. So that wasn't part of my uh, reason to get sober, but, uh, <laughs> but it certainly was that, guys. And uh, that's why they call it anonymous. So. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the wildest stories. There's yeah. definitely been, I've heard so many over like the, I don't know, 15 years I've been going or something like that. Yeah, so you're, and you're, sober for a very long time except for actually my yes i have my my second so yeah i was sober for seven years and then i relapsed and i'm back on the wagon and actually my sobriety birthday is on saturday i will have six years that's amazing thanks and i was also remembering one of the other times that you had me on here um i was drinking whiskey while i was on your podcast you were you were you and francois yeah yeah Um, because uh, the first time I was on your podcast, I was I wasn't drinking anything. I think um, I think anything that was important in my life, I I managed to like curtail it enough to like function. Right? It's when I didn't have anything particularly important going on that I just you know unwind and uh, it didn't matter. Consequences be damned. But um, but yeah, I remember coming in uh, pretty hungover to, to do that podcast. I don't recommend you looking for it. It wasn't funny either. That was mostly because of Francois. I was adorable. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I was uh, I was drinking. So uh, and this is just a, a delicious uh, glass of Monster Energy. They watched me pour it in here, so I'm not lying. Again. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean that, and that's the thing, right? You always go from like alcohol yeah. to like absurd amounts of caffeine. Oh my god! It's like you got to have something in your life, right? And I'm drinking it out of the signature Holly Randall unfiltered mm-hmm. mug. If for any of you out there who would like to uh, own a piece of this particular podcast, I suggest you uh, inquire within, and this can you be can yours. Go to shophollyrandall.com. See, look at that. Look at that. All right. Get your own mug to not put alcohol in. Yeah, to not or, or put, put alcohol. alcohol in. I don't give a we fuck. Don't Whatever. Care. Uh, we right. don't care. Yeah. Okay. So, and it's funny how it works, right? Because, yeah, I was expecting some kind of like crazy rock bottom moment. And I had so many rock bottoms and that did not stop me, right? And they say like, your bottom is when you stop digging. And same for me, it was like, it wasn't like any, the first time or the second time, it wasn't like any one particular thing. It was just like, I don't know. I just, one day I just got tired. And, but I had been trying the whole time on both occasions. Yeah, I just got tired and I was like, I can't, yeah, I can't do this anymore. Like, fuck me. I mean, what I have to say is admirable about you is that you didn't, you did it like on your own. You went to meetings and you basically, you know, stopped drinking. Whereas I had to go away both times. Like I had to go away to a place where like they tested me on a daily basis. And I had to like sleep in a bunk bed with like a 19 in a room full of like a bunch of 19 year olds. (laughs) And um, yeah, I like had to be taken out of my element, taken away from it because I could not, I could not stop on my own. Well, I I, I mean, I went to to detox twice. I went to the yeah. good old Tarzana treatment center. Um, uh, and the reason I did that was because I had, I had strung myself out so badly that I, I, now I can't function. I remember going to work one day, first time. And, uh, I, of course I drank in the morning before I went to work as I often did. And then I got to work and I remember picking the camera up and I was just sweating, just like that horrible feeling of like, and the anxiety. And I'm like, I'm like trying to shoot porn 
And again, low bar of entry to porn, but the camera should at least be steady, I think, right? Then again, I've seen some OnlyFans stuff, so who knows? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently, that's not important either. Unless you but, want to apply warp stabilizer yeah, warp to everything, stabilizer. which is going to take that, forever didn't exist to render. Then. Yeah. <laughs> and I just remember, so I'm shooting at a friend's house, and it was the location, and I was just like, Oh, okay. He's also a you know degenerate alcoholic. So I go to his liquor cabinet. He's got this giant Costco-sized bottle of Patron, and I remember doing five shots, just like boom, 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 five shots of Patron. About ten minutes after that, I felt normal, right, completely normal. And I had this moment where I'm like, I I now have to drink to be sober. Like yeah. this isn't like this wasn't like let's party. This was just like I need to get even, right. So then I, I'm like, okay, I, that's a problem. I'm going to go into detox. And I went to detox. And um, and that was, you know, five days of, you know, um, whatever. They just check you every day and make sure blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, I got out of detox and thought, that was easy. And I'm never going to drink again. And fuck. And then, of course, people are like, well, you should go to AA. I'm like, AA, bunch of fucking people sitting around on uncomfortable chairs in a church basement just wishing they were drinking. I got this. And I need no fucking higher power nonsense. Yeah. As it turns out, I was wrong. So uh, <laughs> I had a massive relapse, and uh, I went right back to uh, almost seven more years of uninterrupted drinking. And then I hit that same thing again. I'll never forget it. It was at, right around the corner, the HQ Gastro Pub right here in Woodland Hills. Mm -hmm. I had 14 margaritas. I had four shots of tequila independent of those margaritas, and I had two old fashions. What, you had 14 margaritas? Yeah. In a time span of how long? However, whatever time we got there to whatever time it closed. So, you know, maybe four hours. I don't know. And anyway, I woke up the next day and I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. Like, it's just that blanket of anxiety is around you. And I'm like, I'm chugging Bloody Marys. I'm trying to get even again. And I couldn't do it. So, um, and I was still married at the time. And I remember we were supposed to leave for Cabo the very next day because um, we had a timeshare, which thank God we got out of that. But at the time we did. I'm like, I can't go. I can't function. So she was like, well, if you can't go on vacation, you're going to go back to detox. So then I went back to detox again. I was there the same amount of time, five days. I got out. I'm like, thank God. Dodged a bullet again. Stayed sober for about three months. Uh, again, just thought I could do it on my own. And uh, and just, I didn't. I just, it's, it's a, the craziest thing. And there's an interesting thing, and I don't want to make this all about AA because I know anybody watching this just wants to hear me talk about uh, sucking uh, in girls and tits. So anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, but there's a thing in the book, uh, and I'll misquote it, but I'll paraphrase it, but uh, we cannot recall uh, with sufficient urgency, I think, uh, the humiliation and uh, pain, essentially, of even a week or a month ago. Like, so even though I was like literally in the fetal position and had just come out of this, you know, detox facility where I was like just the ultimate demoralization as we talk about, you know, I, it, it wasn't a real thing. I couldn't conjure that back up in my mind. All I could remember is how good it felt to drink. And that's right there. Right. So there you go. Uh, until 14 months ago, knock on wood, it ain't happening again. So, yeah. What do you think? At. So what do you think is different this time? That program is the only difference. It's the only thing I, again, I don't want to get emotional. It's about porn. I will never be able to stay sober without it. I know that for a fact. And I never wanted to admit that. I never wanted to admit I had a problem. And then I did admit I had a problem. And then it was just kind of funny. It's like, oh, that's his mic. He's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and even getting, you know, I never got sober. I just quit drinking for a while. And, um, and I thought I could do that on my own. I was very arrogant about, about all of that. And then, you know, you realize... It ain't about you uh, at some point. And um, then I had to get humble and I did. And I'm extraordinarily grateful. Yeah. So there. Yeah. Let's move on. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Not, we're not ending this topic until you have tears. Come on, Dr. Phil. Down Come on. Your face. <laughs> no. You want to, you want to see tears streaming down my face, let, or streaming down my face. Let's talk about my uh, personal life <laughs> aside from that. Uh, continue. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things. And, you know, I always want to stress when we do talk about the program um, that, you know, it works for us. It doesn't yes. work for everybody because 100%. never want to like feel like pushing it on anyone and, and, and everybody has their own method. And I yeah. certainly know people who've gotten sober without it. And it's like, you know, whatever works for you, but yeah, it's the same for me. It's kind of like this, I definitely never wanted to go 
to start. And I'm sure you felt the same way, yeah. you know, the first couple of times I went and I was like, this is a fucking cult. It's yeah, full of 100%. a bunch of weird people. All yeah. the God stuff made me yeah, very that, uncomfortable. I was not comfortable with that at all. No, because also because I was raised an atheist. Right. Well, and so yeah. actually what I did was I went to atheist meetings. Right. There are like atheist yeah. and agnostic meetings, yeah. um, which take the word God out of the, a lot of the sayings, which was super helpful for me. Yeah. And, you know, able to talk to other people who didn't believe in like a traditional God. And they talked about like how the program worked for them. That was super helpful for me. And now like, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me so no. much anymore. Like hearing I mean, I'm, I'm the still word, not a, the God word, like, right. but it used to really like. Make I'm still not a, I'm still not a huge fan of the Lord's prayer tradition yeah. thing, but it's, Same. it's a very small price to pay for what else I get from it. And the higher power thing was very difficult. It's why, you know, I, I, cause I, same thing I've been, uh, a very uh, avowed atheist. And it was difficult for me to wrap my head around that. But, you know, the great thing about, you know, that book is pick a God, just pick something that isn't you, just something separate from you. And, you know, I've been a musician my whole life. That's what I would have done had uh, I not been a successful pornographer. Uh, as it turns <laughs> out, it turns out my passion was watching people sucking and fucking for a living. I, uh, um, but no, so I, I just, you know, that was my thing. It's like, okay, there's something, there's something, there's some universal law that makes 12 notes go together to create all this music that every single human being on the face of the earth, when you hear it, it you know, it conjures something that you can't explain. Yeah. And I don't know what the fuck is behind that. I don't know what power source, whatever you want to call it, but it exists and I'm going with that. And it's been, that's been my sort of foundation since, since I chose that as my thing. Yeah. yeah I like that. Yeah. For me, it's the like community of people and the power of the collective, like well, that, people that coming too, together sure. yeah. to help each other, you know? For sure. And I think about like, for me, like God, quote unquote, shows up in other people, mm -hmm. you know, and like opportunities and other people who are like there for you when you need them. And these like in crazy coincidence moments where it's like, oh my God, I wouldn't have made it if it hadn't been for like this one thing. Like yeah. that's kind of what it is for me. Um, so, so that's, yeah, yeah, and everybody has their thing. And it's funny what you say about the Lord's Prayer because I used to walk out of meetings when they would say that because yeah, yeah. I was I like, the fuck this shit. Too. And I, you know what I think of now? So when I was trying to get sober the second time, um, it was weird because get, trying to get sober the second time was almost harder than the first time because I knew what was at, on the other side. You know, right. I had been sober for seven years. I knew how happy I was then, how fulfilled I was. I built this career, like life felt like, I, I was present in my life when I was, you know, during my relapse. And I got like, and also too, during my relapse of four years, like I got big chunks of sobriety yeah. in that year. I yeah, just sure. never hit a year. Right. I got like three months, six months, nine months. So like, it's funny if you actually look at that time period, I was actually sober for a majority of the time, right. but I just never got to like that full year. So I didn't get to say that I had a year, but anyways, um, and so there was this meeting that I used to go to, and there were these two older men that I would sit with in the front row that were really kind to me and always like supported me through all of this. You got to meet them mm -hmm. when you came to yeah. my mm -hmm. to my You're birthday. Fighter, yeah. yeah. And um and one of them specifically, whenever we would say like the Lord's Prayer, when we would say, um, deliver us from, he would always say evil, <laughs> like in this stupid wake way. Like, <laughs> like like Austin Powers. Yeah, exactly. Like we would do it as a joke. Dr. Evil. Yeah, we'd be like, deliver us from <laughs> evil. And then we'd be like, hee hee. And I don't know, I always think of that. And so the Lord's Prayer now reminds me of like those two men who like held my hand and like let me cry like every day in the front row because I was like so unhappy and I couldn't get there. So it reminds me of them and that support. So. So that's like where my mind goes when I say that. Definitely nothing about like, you know, actual God or anything. It's amazing. We'll move on soon, folks. I promise. It's amazing though when you realize. Thank God you have that fast forward button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this podcast brought to you by the fine people at. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, it's amazing how you don't realize how unhappy you were because mm -hmm. it's it's um the whole thing regarding addiction is is masking everything. Right? Yeah. So you create this illusion. For yourself and then the longer that goes on the more that becomes your reality so that's why it's so scary to to get sober if you've been an addict for a very long time because you're it's like superman taking off his cape it's like what do i do now you know i have to be me i don't want to be me that's why i started drinking in the first place yeah that's yep. why i started drinking in the first place because i this i don't like this guy this guy's horrible um as it turns out he's not that bad of a guy <laughs> <laughs> 
So, you know, I mean, other people may disagree with that, but you know, that, and that's tough, man. That first year, I understand why they say, you know, don't stress yourself emotionally, mentally or whatever. Don't date, don't do anything complicated for that yeah. first year. And I completely agree with that because you're trying to figure out who you are yeah. without this substance, whether it's alcohol or, or whatever. But, yeah. um, and then, you know, I don't know. It turns out you, you're not so bad after all. So. Yeah. But it's also like you have to do all this work. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. getting sober is the first part. Yeah, yeah. No, stopping drinking is the is the, actually kind of the easy the part. The easiest part. It's yeah. It's living staying uh, sober yeah, and living and with living, yourself. Yeah, exactly. And living life on life's terms, as they say. And not having that like quick escape yeah. into um, relief. I and did I, something. I miss that a lot. No, I do like, too. There are definitely times I'm like, fuck, man, I wish I could just have a drink and like get rid of this like horrible feeling that I have. But like I can't because it won't. It'll never just be wondering. And it, yeah, and that's the thing. You know, they, it's a, all these cliches. When I first started hearing them, I'm like, uh, fucking another fucking AA cliche. One's never enough, or one is too many. Ten is never enough. Whatever. In subtle ways, right? You talk about like I started. I'm not going to get into specifics, but I was working for somebody that I hadn't worked for before, and I sent them their content, and they sent me an email that was kind of terse and very critical. And my ego immediately came up where I'm like, I've been doing this for 30 fucking years. Who the fuck are you to tell me what I did wrong and blah, blah, blah. And old Mike would have, that would have triggered me to p pick up a bottle of vodka or Crown Royal or something because I can't handle things like that. I would have self-medicated and I probably would have fired off a shitty email back. And this time I literally did nothing. I read it. I let my anger go away and I waited two fucking days before I responded because I'm like, I don't want to have the anger. I don't want, I just want to be clear headed and say, you know what? Sorry, it didn't work out. And that's basically what I said. And then they emailed me back and they're like, no, 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 we liked it. We just wanted to point these things out. So if I, old Mike would have burned that bridge immediately, you yeah. know? So I'm not entirely sure I want to cross it again, but it's there <laughs> if I want to, you know? Yeah. The, the um, like, Jer knee jerk reaction, yeah. email responses, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, those are still hard for me. Yeah, like I really got to pull back from that because I definitely still like want to no, be like, for sure. oh yeah. no, 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 let me like, let me tell you, like, oh my god, when like <laughs> Twisties used to do this like review, they used to do like, oh, oh god, oh. like every yeah. month they'd yeah, send yeah, yeah. like in a review. And like most of it was positive, right. you know, like 90% of it was like, love this, it love this, matter. love the this. The 10% is what's going to trigger you. The 10%. And it would even, it wouldn't be like, you suck. It'd be like, hey, you know, like, could we change this? And, the, and I could tell that they were trying to put yeah. it in the nicest way. But fuck, man. I, it got to the point actually towards the end. I just, sorry, guys. I stopped reading them. Yeah. I just didn't read them because I get so angry. And um, that's like, what, like, what kind of way is that to to be, you know, like know. that's not professional. No, like we all have not. room for improvement and every client has something different that they want. Yeah. And you have to be open to that and 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 follow through with that because they're paying you. Like they are the client. It's you tough. are the vendor. It's like, tough in this business too because I mean, nobody gets into I mean, I don't know, at least for me, it's like I as a, as someone that moved to LA to be a musician and and I didn't go to high school really. And uh, I was not a very, I was not a person that you could talk to, or I didn't take orders. I didn't like to be, I didn't like to have a boss, you know, obviously nobody does, but it was inconceivable to me to have that kind of nine to five life. Right. It was just not something I was going to do. So then you kind of get into this business. And again, I'm not, I'm joking, but not really, it's not that hard to do porn. It's really kind of an easy thing to do. So if you're halfway intelligent, you can probably figure it out. Um, but it's the same thing. You're kind of living on your own terms. So then, you know, porn has become very corporate in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And now you have to answer to people. And every time, uh, and I had a very good gig for a long time. I worked for a very good friend of mine at Zero Tolerance for 20 years, right? So I didn't have to answer to anybody for 20 years, for the most part, you know. We'd have arguments, you know, where I would fly off the handle and be like, fuck you, you don't know what you're talking about. And I knew I wouldn't get fired, right? Because I had that relationship. Then that company got sold. I didn't get a dime out of that sale, by the way. <laughs> I actually <laughs> co-founded the company. Those men are all very rich now. I'm not bitter and I'm not going to go back to alcohol. Let's move on. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so now the new corporate overlords uh, throw shit at me. I don't work for them anymore, but uh, the, the corporate overlords that I do work for, it's all very by the book and it's a, it's not a way that I'm used to operating and I don't like it at all, but it's either that or I uh, join the uh, 
thriving homeless population here in Los Angeles and, uh, you know, uh, start talking to my imaginary friends while I'm uh, putting <laughs> methamphetamine on a shard of glass or something. I don't know. I don't want to do that either. So <laughs> let's take a quick commercial break. We'll come back. We'll talk about how porn has changed. We'll start talking about the dick sucking. And yeah, we're getting the, to duck, dick sucking, folks. And don't, the titty yeah, fucking and all that stuff, Speaking I Speaking of titties, huh? Huh? We'll be right back. Once again, to those listening, Holly is uh, jiggling her breasts right now. They're moving back and forth in poetic wave-like motion. Thank you very much for listening. All right, here we go. This episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Who wants better sex? And who wants to start having better sex immediately? The best way to get started is to go to adamandeve.com right now, the online superstore for everything sexy. They are offering 50% off of any one item. Plus, when you select your one item, you will also get three special bonus gifts that includes an item for him, a special toy for her, and something we know you'll both enjoy. Also, get six free movies and free discreet shipping. But you can only get the special offer when you go to adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. So be sure to use code HOLLY to get your 50% discount, 10 free gifts, and free shipping today. Hello, everybody. We are back. (laughs) Once again, the breasts were jiggling in a (laughs) back-and-forth fashion like the smooth, calm waves on a lovely summer day in Malibu, California. There they are, folks. Why don't you do like a voiceover gig, actually, if you like stop working in porn? I could. However, I feel like AI is just going to take that job, too. So what's the point? You know what I mean? Like at some point, it's going to take my job regardless. So I'm just, you know, it is what it is. (laughs) AI actually has a better voice than me, so who am I to compete with a fucking machine? I saw Terminator 2. I know what's coming. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about – so let's talk about the adult industry. Yes. The, That's why the we're thing here. that people tune in. The, the reason why you care about any of this. I will say, though, that we – every time I do a long conversation about sobriety, I get one or two people who, like, write in and say how much it meant to them. And I've had some people say that they've actually, like, sought help. So if I, if, you know, we can help one person, like we lost a hundred due to boredom, but we saved one. That's all that matters. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. If we can help one person dig their way out of that dark hole that is addiction, then that's (laughs) worth all of the like 5,000 people that logged off immediately. They all went to to the bar. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so you've been in the adult industry f- longer than I have, which is wild because I always feel like I'm like the oldest, longest lasting person. Well, you got ever. in young, so did I. And yeah. You also come from a long lineage of, of uh, proud pornographers. So, yeah. You know, there's that. Yeah, I guess I, I was sort of like have been in it yeah. since I began. Yes. Breathe, breath. Yes, yes. So um, tell me the biggest, some of the biggest changes you've seen in the adult industry since your time. The biggest one is is that. The biggest one is sort of, you know, the corporate sort of takeover of porn. And um, it's not it, it's not about sex anymore. You'd think, and it's kind of an odd thing to say, but porn is, very little of porn is about sex. It's about you clicking on shit and maybe paying for something somewhere because everything's free, right? So they kind of dug their own grave with that, um, with the tube sites. It's like, you know, we're going to get all this traffic and now we have all these eyeballs Oh, fuck. Now we have to monetize it. How are we going to do that? Well, I got an idea. I always do the French Canadian accent. So I'm going to do that again. Uh, Jean Pierre, uh, we have this great website that everybody go to it every day. Uh, apparently, more people go there than to CNN, but uh, not making any money. Uh, what do you suggest we do? Uh, Jean Pierre, I have a great idea. We take a pretty girl, right? And an uh, attractive man, and uh, uh, they fuck? No, 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 no. <laughs> she is stuck in a washing machine or maybe dishwasher or something like that. Maybe she trip over an ironing board, and he's maybe he's in an easy chair. He's jerking off to some other porn that we don't know and she fall on him and uh, Jean-Pierre this is a brilliant idea I think it's going to save the industry let's go to Tim Hortons and then they go and they have coffee and that's what happens so um, I if you're if you as a consumer are so fucking tired of seeing the most I call it cartoon porn now there's no other word for it because <laughs> it's literally it's just people in in you know, I'm falling through a wall I'm falling into a into a in a washing machine I'm doing you know whatever and everybody's always surprised that anybody's doing anything sexual every fucking porn scene now is like what my cock your bre- I don't understand I thought we were in 
I don't, so it's not about sex anymore. And if you want it to be about sex, stop fucking clicking on people stuck in washing machines. That's all I can say. All right. Then maybe they'll go, uh, you know, the washing machine is not converting anymore. Maybe we should, uh, I don't know, shoot uh, somebody sucking a cock. I don't know. Call me crazy. I probably, just, I probably don't have any more work now, just so you know. So good thing I'm sober. I won't be able to afford alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's been the biggest change for me. <laughs> so for for all of you who are like, what is he talking about? These are called ad scenes. And essentially, if you go to any big tube site, you'll see these little like kind of speeded up GIFs um, that are showing these ridiculous, wild and wacky situations. And those are big traffic drivers and people tend to click on those. And then um, it might lead you to a website where this wild and wacky scene that of the girl stuck in a washing machine um, who falls into a guy in a recliner <laughs> is the girl in the washing machine. So speaking of ad scenes, so you've done like probably more ad scenes than anybody I know. Um, yeah. You're like the expert on ad scenes. In fact, m my last couple shoots for Twisties, they started doing ad scenes again. And I was like, fuck this. Because ad scenes are actually like the biggest pain in the ass to shoot. Um, and I called Mike and I was like, can I please pay you to just come and shoot this ad scene? And I literally like didn't do anything that day. Like I just sat back and let, and he was an amazing, like <laughs> I, I total expert. Like, yep. Girl hiding behind sofa. Other two come in. Don't know she's there. Uh, they're the, okay. I got this one. Don't worry about it. And We're then there's a guy yeah. that almost yeah, catches almost, them. Almost catch it. You almost all the time you're almost caught. And then at the end you do get caught and somebody's humiliated and somebody makes the home alone face and then, you know, whatever. <laughs> and if you can jerk off to that, I, God bless you. That's all I can say. <laughs> so tell me some of the most ridiculous ad scenes that you've shot. And look, I, I'm not saying I know better than the people in Montreal or the people wherever they are that monetize porn. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying as someone that's been around through all the iterations of, except for the golden era back in the eighties, I started in 1992. Um, as a PA. So I've seen how that goes. So maybe that's just reality. It's fine. But the scenarios tend to all be the same, right? They're just varying degrees of, of um, they'll change it up a little bit. But I, I, sometimes, I will get scripts sometimes where I'm like, I already shot this one. They added this little extra thing here, or they took away this little extra thing. But you know, I mean, there's always the, the GoPro shot. You've seen it a million fucking times. Somebody opens a fridge, the fucking there, and there's a the point of view of the inside of the fridge. And then the stepson walks up behind them and fucking just haphazardly jams his cock in her. And he's like, oh my God, I was just getting a pie out of the freezer. How did this happen? I don't know. There's somebody, that kind of thing. It, it's absurd. They always want that. They want anything that will make that 10 second GIF as interesting as possible. And so they recycle a lot of stuff too, you know, mm -hmm. um, they, there are certain positions. People complain sometimes that, you know, porn is so formulaic. It's always the same positions over and over again. Like in girl, girl porn, for example, a lot of the ads want scissoring. They always yes. want that. Oh my God. Uh, that does very well for us. Every it's the worst scene. fucking thing. Scissoring. If you actually care about um, lesbian erotica, as I like to call it, I, it's my favorite thing to shoot. If I have actually anything that I enjoy shooting, it would be that. Girls don't do that. Like, it's just not a thing you do. It's a thing you do when you run out of ideas. It's like, yeah. well, we still need five more minutes. Well, I guess fucking pretend you're both fucking grasshoppers and do this for, you know, and <laughs> all right, we're good. Let's go get lunch. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but they, they want that. So there's not a whole it's lot It's because of, with girl, girl, like it's the most action in a position, right? Because right, right? exactly. otherwise they're kind of static. Or a giant fucking dildo or something, right? Yeah. But I always say with girl, girl porn, it's like, okay, if I want to see a girl impaled by you know, this giant fucking black dildo, I'll just subscribe to Dreads OnlyFans. And I, you know, I don't need to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm still, I still try and be as creative as I can within the parameters that are set. I mean, my main gig, I should plug it, is um, for Mile High, which is Sweet Center and Sweetheart and Doghouse Digital and Reality Junkies and the great uh, John Blit, who's employed me for the last three years. Shout out. Anyway, uh, he also, he knows of my low self-esteem and he plays on that a lot. So I feel like he takes advantage of me, but uh, you didn't hear me say that. <laughs> oh, maybe you did. All right. Um <laughs> But I started shooting for Wicked again. It's probably only once or twice a year, but they're like, just write a funny script. We, You're our comedy guy now. So I'm like, all right, that I can do. And I did that, and that was fun. And there's no, there was no ad moments that had to be in it. It was just write a funny movie. So so that's cool. But I also need to feed my dog and myself. So I'll shoot as many people stuck in washing machines as you need me to shoot. So, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> if you, in fact, still think I'm, uh, uh, you know, worthy of uh, gainful employment, uh, reach out to me. I'm always available. I just want to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sober now, so it might be in focus. Just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just think about how great you were when you were drinking. I mean, you're known as like the fastest shooter in the West, right? Like if you're on a Mike Quasar set, you're in and out of there in like a few hours, guaranteed. Yeah. yeah. And how do you how do you shoot that quickly? Well, uh, it's threefold, maybe. The first is that um, porn is fine. I love porn. Don't get me wrong. Wasn't what I wanted to do for a living. So it's like, it's almost like when you go to work at Starbucks, you're like hanging around after your shift is over. No, you're like, I'm done. I've seen enough coffee for the day. I want to get the fuck out of here. Um, secondly, I edit everything I shoot for the most part. So I edit while I'm shooting. I'm like, I'm going to need this shot. I'm going to need this shot. I'm going to need this close up. We don't need that and blah, blah, blah. Or, and it's just a judgment thing, right? So when the scene is going, if the scene is working, I'm not going to stop you. I don't want to tell you how to have sex. You, I barely know how to have it myself. You're much better at it than I am. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to let you do your thing. And uh, and so that just comes with the experience of years and years and years of watching people bone in front of you. And uh, and then when we're done, we're done. And it used to be I, I just want to go home. That was my mantra. And I still just want to go home. It used to be because I wanted to go home and drink. Now I realize I just would rather be at home. Yeah. You know, so um, that's that's it. And I and I had been on sets for other people and whatever. I'm not saying anything, uh, you know, good or bad, but some people really like being on set and they're not in a hurry. Yeah, and, it's like their uh, social life. And I'm like, you know what? I don't have much of a social life, but I don't want this to be it either. So uh, <laughs> I'll go to, I'll join a book club or something. I just got to get the fuck out of here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, so I think that you, one of the things that you said is, is really a key to being a good director. And I've learned this through my journey and I am by no means saying I'm a very good director. Oh, you're a fine um, director. I'm, I'm, that's exactly, no, I'm fine. I mean, fine I'm fine, and, and, no. but I'm like, right. I'm, I'm okay. I'm fine. Okay. I'm a better photographer than I am a you're, director. Well, like I will both, say that yes. for sure. Yes. Editing, knowing how to edit is everything. Yes. Because before I kind of, and I have like limited editing skills, but I can edit. Before I did that, I would overshoot something or not realize that there was a certain shot that I needed to make the transition make sense or something like that. So I think for anybody who wants to become a really great director, learning how to edit, I think is key. And that's like in whatever you do, whether it's porn or anything else, like that yeah. is so important. Only age wise, am I making this co the comparison, but Clint Eastwood famously <laughs> uh, is one of those guys that's like, good enough, let's move on, right? Yeah. You know, or as uh, my friend David Crawford, likes to call it Gimo, good enough, move on. That's it. Yeah. You know, where we could do this all day if we want, but we got what we need, let's move on. A lot of people, you know, and it's fine if that's what works, but some people are shooting with two cameras, three cameras, four cameras, and I feel like a lot of that is just because, well, you know, we don't want to miss anything, right? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, even with multiple cameras, some editor somewhere in Montreal or Budapest or Czech Republic or somebody somewhere is just sitting there making arbitrary decisions on when to switch cameras, yeah. right? Uh, it's time for a close-up. Uh, boring, let's go to face. You know, that's <laughs> literally what somebody's doing if yeah. you're shooting with, with uh, multicam like that. So I just make those decisions while I'm shooting. So it's way faster that way, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but again, I think that just comes from, I have shot probably over 5,000 scenes at this point. And I don't, if you're not good at something after doing it, that it's like the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours thing, man. It's like, I got 10, hundred thousand hours. Is that a number? I have a hundred thousand hours. Um, so I can shoot porn in my sleep. And sometimes I do, cause I dream about it. Anyway. <laughs> uh, do you think that porn, shooting porn has affected your sex life and how you have sex? I have sex. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Let's assume that someone took pity on you oh, right. and had sex with you. Uh, do, do you think it is different now? Like, I mean, you know, this is something that, I mean, we shoot this very intimate thing for yeah. a living. Do you think that it affects well, how you have intimacy? What we shoot typically isn't intimate though. It's, it's a lot of times it's, circus performance, right? Mm. I was having this conversation with, I always joke about it because I, you know, um, uh, I think I'm funny. I'm not. Uh, but I was talking about how, you know, what's your, uh, you know, what's your, what do you like, uh, you know, when you have sex with somebody, I'm like, uh, I'm a big fan of missionary in the dark. That That's me. Like I, you know, because it's like, you know, not that that happens very often, but on the occasion that, like you said, someone uh, returns a phone call, uh, I'm a big fan of that because I'm like, you know, everything, porn is supposed to be fantasy, right? 
And like, I love watching a Tom Cruise movie. It's great when he's like swinging off a high rise in Dubai. I don't want to fucking do that. It's entertaining to watch, but uh, I'll just take the elevator, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, so for any prospective dates out there, if you're expecting me to, you know, organize a last minute bukkake or something after dinner, that's not going to happen. It'll be, <laughs> it'll be missionary in the dark. If, if that actually, so we, we may just we may just fall asleep watching uh, 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 what's that uh, baby reindeer on Netflix, which was exceptional, by the way. Yes, uh, very very good, anyway. very creepy. But and, uh, to that point, though, I, I over the years that I when I've done any news thing or documentary or anything like that, people always ask if porn, you know, uh, creates sex offenders. Does porn create this this aberrant behavior? And uh, I'm always like, well, I've seen more porn than anybody ever. And uh, if I was going to commit a crime, it would be to tell to break into a woman's house and tell her to put her clothes back on. That's what <laughs> I would do. I'd be like, all right, bitch, do what I tell you. Put those pants on. <laughs> you know, I'm like, mm. uh, because it's you know, I mean, it's it's just, it's like after a while, it's you know, do I want to. Uh, in my personal life, do I want to invite a friend over? Like, hey, I'm going out with so and so Friday night. You want to come? Uh, bring your erection. Like, I'm not doing that. Yeah, you know, that's weird. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think honestly that people. First of all, I think that repression, sexual repression, and shame, if anything, that leads to what maybe some people might consider it to be like deviant sexual sure. behaviors. And of course, that's also like up for debate. I think that anything is that's between two consenting adults, which is like legal, is like whatever, you know, like not going to yuck your yum, you know, your kinks are your kinks and that's fine. I think that when you get sexual deviance or deviance is the wrong word, uh, like sexual predators or something yeah. like that, like in the adult industry. Who are probably also deviants to be fair, but yeah. <laughs> but I think that they, they, they were not created that by porn, no. right? Like porn, they perhaps were attracted to porn because that's like the, you know, what they're obsessed with. And then Porn can be right. a place that they can have access, you know, to more of that. But it definitely, I do not believe, creates that in people whatsoever. I think there's a predisposition well, towards that for some yeah, reason. Yeah, well, it's a, it, you can make the same argument with alcohol. It's like alcohol exists, but not everybody's an alcoholic. Yes. You know, it's really... I know. Um, it's, you know, it's part of it's a choice and part of it's just like if you're going to go down that path. But porn for a lot of people, especially uh, in, you know, in OnlyFans, just from people that are I'm friends with, like people like Freya or whoever that, you know, have people that they actually have personal interactions that are genuine conversations, you know, with porn stars. They're very respectful. And, and to some guys, maybe they don't have like a, an exciting personal life. Maybe they do work some stupid job. Maybe they, they feel kind of isolated. So for somebody to, to show them some kindness or something, I mean, I think that's, that's, you know, I mean, fine, they're still jerking off to them too, but whatever, you know what yeah. I mean? It, it's not like they're, it's not like they're um, being disrespectful about it, you know, but I, but then you see the same thing. I mean, like when you're talking about Twitter being a dumpster fire, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, cause anybody can say anything now. Right. But right. so you can make an argument for or against that, whatever, that's a whole separate conversation, but you really see a lot of horrible horrible comments now from from men presumably um that aren't bots that are just like they, they get off like their their kink is to like tell girls in porn how dirty disgusting what's your father you whore and blah 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 meanwhile you know they're you know jerking yeah off like to why this. are yeah. you if you're so offended by these people why yeah, don't, are you don't following them yeah, don't, don't follow watch, them yeah how do you even know who they are because it gives them a sense of of power right right and um because they probably feel powerless in their life, especially sexually. Well, that's, and that's the whole incel community, yeah. of which I'm almost one now. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I, uh, uh, it's fine. I'm old. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's a, it, it's sort of like um, it's that. It's like this. You know, I can't have you, so I'm just going to, you know, whittle you down to this non-entity and make you, you know. Um, just so I can feel better about myself. It's, yeah. it's unfortunate. You know, it's interesting. I think that there's like such a butterfly effect to all of that. I was having a conversation with my husband about that. And I think that what is leading to a lot of this is, it doesn't even necessarily have to do with like sex on the surface, but it has to do with like the fact that we are so disconnected as a society now. And yeah. we're also on social media and the algorithms are feeding us very specific things. And the more you watch something, it sees that you watch this video for longer. So they're going to feed you more of that. So that's like, did you watch, uh, is it down the rabbit hole? Yeah. It's about like about how YouTube yeah. like 
literally radicalizes yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. But you it's should still the, subscribe to my channel and continue to watch She's all of my a, podcasts. Be a radicalized Holly Randall subscriber. It's folks. okay to be radicalized by <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm radicalizing you towards like tolerance and like love. And, right. Yes. And it's better to be yeah. radical that way. Yeah. Yes, be exactly. radical towards me. Yeah. yeah and so, there, so there's that. I mean, there's a lot of disconnect. I think that there's a lack of community um, in a lot of spaces, you know, like neighbors don't know each other, you know, like we put up these high walls, like we don't, you know, we drive our cars into our garages, we order Postmates, like we don't really connect. And actually, and I am obviously like not a fan of religion in any way, shape or form, but I, I can't help but think about how community centers like the church yeah, no, no, no. There's, provided like a lot of that for people. Yeah. And I find that now in you know, 12 step meetings. Yeah. And I feel so grateful that I have that exactly. because like otherwise, and also when you get older, like it's really hard to make friends with adults, it's, it's, you know? It's, it's much harder because everybody already has their, enough friends. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm going to add a new friend. Yeah. And, so. and then when it comes to men, I think also to the way that like we have dismantled uh, pensions, um, the fact that like men cannot, and this is what I was talking with my husband about, like that, you know, back in the day, you used to be able to get a job out of high school that you didn't need like a ton of training for. Um, and you could afford a home in the suburbs. You could get a pension. You could take care of your family and you could feel like you were a worthwhile contributor to society and you could be like rewarded in a decent way for that. Like we don't have that anymore. Like people don't have pensions anymore. Like the corporate structure has taken that away from the everyday worker. And so like the 1% just get richer and richer and richer. And I think that there's a lot of men that are coming out now that don't have like great job prospects. So they don't feel like valuable. They don't feel like they can be a provider. And I truly believe that one of the keys to human happiness is feeling that you have purpose in the world and that you can contribute something to whatever and that you're needed. And I feel a lot of people don't feel that way. And I think that that is really starting to come out in all of these other ways. And, you know, all this anger and these incels and this red pill movement, it's just like, also, I think like this whole concept of influencers is, and I'm very th grateful or uh, happy for anybody that I know that's an influencer that's doing well and blah, blah, blah. But it also creates this, uh, this thing that's not real, that it's shoved in your face every day. These beautiful people doing these beautiful things and they have unlimited funds and they're this. And it's like, most people don't live like that. But they're basically bombarded with it where it's like you feel like less than because you can't live like that. You know what I mean? Like, um, and I, I get it when I see, I mean, I, I've been in this business forever, but I see people that, you know, that I know that are, you know, making a fortune on OnlyFans or doing this or doing that. And I'm just like, oh, man, I suck. I didn't yeah. figure any of this out. I'm yeah. just, uh, I'm going to, you know, die in an unmarked grave and, uh, you know, a hobo is going to pee on me or something like that. But uh <laughs> But, uh, you know, I mean, it, it does, it, it's, it's just like, it creates this, this division, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like it, it, but circling back around the other thing, it's like OnlyFans also is probably a good way for people that, uh, to connect, um, it, when, when the times happen that they're actually connecting to a real person, but, you know, um, at least there's a, a sense that you're part of something as opposed to just, you know, this faceless thing behind a computer. Yeah. I mean, I've noticed that, that a lot of the conversations that I have, with the guys on my OnlyFans are, yeah, there's always like the sex and like, can I see your titties? And like, can I see your asshole? The answer is no. Stop asking to see my butthole. I don't fucking show it. I swear to God, if one more person asks me, I'm going to post his butthole instead yeah. and say it's mine. <laughs> Although she showed it to me once during that relapse. I'm kidding. I've never, <laughs> I've never seen anything but the same cleavage you're all staring at right now. Like I said, like a hypnosis medallion. This might help you quit smoking. Just look right there. <laughs> Back and forth, all right. <laughs> but there is a lot of conversation around, um, like, th they're just their day-to-day -day life, you know? Like, they talk to me about, like, their health problems, their family members, their, you know, like, I had this one amazing um, message from a guy who's, like, a pastor who said that watching my podcast has made him, like, feel more compassionate towards like sex workers and he wants to, you know, really like make his church like a home for people of, of all kinds and diversity and like embracing all, you know, and just like made him more open to love. And I was like, wow. That's powerful. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So I just, yeah. So OnlyFans has been great in that sense, but also, you know, like 
you got to have relationships with real people that you see face to face in no. your daily life too. Yeah. Um, and I don't know like what the answer is to that. I don't know. Cause I just went to a concert the other night and the same thing. It's like, nobody's looking at the band. They're all looking at their phone, looking at the band. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. and to, you know, I mean, that's, I, I kind of why I appreciate so much. I didn't in the beginning, but now I appreciate so much going to meetings because you're not supposed to text. You're not, you're not going to be on your phone. You're not taking selfies at a meeting. It's anonymous, yeah. you know? So it's for that hour or an hour and a half, you're literally connecting with real people. So it's, that's been yeah. very helpful. Well, I have a couple of questions for my Patreon members before okay. we wrap it up. So are either of them about your, uh, my ample bo bosom. <laughs> well, no, because they had no idea that it was making this kind of oh. like, pr um, you know. Oh, these were submitted today. previous to. These are submitted oh, previous right. towards anybody knowing what I was. Wearing I would have today. asked about those, but uh, well, well, you can go on my OnlyFans. <laughs> and ask about it. <laughs> I don't have an OnlyFans. I might even show them to you. <laughs> yeah. If I did, though, I would 100% show you my breasts. Anyway, However, if you do ask me for my butthole again, I will show you mics, and yeah. uh, uh, you will never know. During my last relapse, I sent her a selfie of it, so she has it. I'm kidding. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> okay, so first question is from Polly Paul. How long have you been playing drums, and how did you get hooked up with your current band? Uh, I started playing drums when I was 12, so um, that was 400 years ago, and... Uh, um, I've been playing ever since. Um, I just don't do it, uh, with the goal of being famous anymore because that passed, uh, uh my true passion was porn. I'm kidding. Uh, and I got hooked up with my favorite band or my current band that I'm playing with just by sheer coincidence, a friend of a friend that knew somebody that they need a drummer. This guy quit. Do you want to do it? I'm like, I got nothing else going on. And strangely, I joined this band who's completely dedicated to, uh, and a celebratory of, um, uh, I, as a heterosexual man, it's odd because the band is called The Cox and every song we have is about being gay because our lead singer is very, very gay. So if you look at The Cox, look up The Cox on Spotify and you can hear such songs as Sugar on the Rim, uh, Dr. Booty, uh, Brotein. These are all available for your <laughs> listening pleasure wherever you uh, listen to music. <laughs> All right. And then the last question from our Patreon members, this is the political one that I warned you oh, about. Jesus Christ. Answer however you would like. Okay. Uh, is from Dave. He says, hi, Mike, I've got to tell you that I've always been so impressed by you. You seem like such a nice and funny guy. If only the circumstances of our lives were different, I bet you and I would be friends. Oh, well, maybe. You never know. As for my question, America faces a choice between a dangerous lunatic in Trump, a feeble old man in Biden, and a Bobby Kennedy Jr., a dope who believes in conspiracy theories. How did we get such an awful choice and who should we vote for? Yeah, I should tell you who to vote for. <laughs> I have my finger on the pulse of anything that uh, – uh, look, I, I, I don't know, man. I'm just going to say this. I – I usually vote for whoever the libertarian candidate is. So I just throw my vote away every year or every four years. Um, I don't know, man, because here's the thing. I, another thing that I, in this polarized world we live in for all the people that think Trump is a deranged lunatic, which I'm sure he is. There's half the other, half the other half of the country loves the guy. And for all the people that think Biden is a feat, well, maybe not after this debate, more people might think that now, but for all the people that think Biden's a feeble old man and he's part of the deep state and everything else, the other half of the country loves him. And three people love RFK Jr. So I don't know. I don't know where. I don't know where to go, man. I mean, you know. Thankfully, I still have my Canadian citizenship. I guess that's all. That's all I could say. The problem is, I don't think that like everybody loves Biden. It's just how much do you hate Trump? And you know, I will say like I am not a Trump fan like whatsoever. Yeah. The fact that like he elected you know judges to the Supreme Court that got Roe versus Wade overturned to me is like absolutely crushing like as a woman like taking away a woman's cho right to choose is like it's a huge issue for me and also he's just like such a horrible person um but also i'm not like crazy about biden you know and and watching that that debate i was just like i just wanted to like shrink into my seat i was like oh my god what the fuck well biden's clearly not the president i mean he's not there so somebody is i don't know who but it's fine uh, the last time I cared about anything was uh, be long before I was uh, eligible to vote when um, Perot was running. When Ross Perot was running against Bush, I was a huge supporter of Ross Perot. I would have followed that little Tolkien character to the end of the earth. He was I just really believed in his message, which was he's not a politician. He just wants to come in and solve the problems and move on. Right. Yeah. And I thought he was great. But that's the last time I gave a shit about anybody running for president. So. Yeah. I really wish that Bernie would have made it in. Mm. But 
Yeah, you know. Anyways, all right, for all my MAGA followers who just <laughs> unfollowed me, sorry, guys. We're going to make podcasts great again. <laughs> yes, but you know what we are going to do right now? Uh-oh. We are going to sing happy birthday to you. Can somebody else be singing with me? Happy sing birthday, birthday. It's very to oh. you. Happy birthday, dear Mike. Happy birthday to you. Yay. Keep coming back. <laughs> Sober. I'm, sh- I'm shocked that I have that much breath in my lungs now that I'm 107 years old. That was very sweet. Thank you Aww, very much. You are so welcome. Oh, put this here temporarily. Yeah, go ahead and put it on the shelf. We will eat it afterwards. We will. <laughs> um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? You can find me on the X platform at Mike Quasar. Um, you can find me at, on Instagram at Mike Quasar too, but I I honestly don't understand Instagram, so I'm not on there very much, but uh, you know, you can send me a message or something. I have a TikTok account just so no one can pretend to be me on TikTok, but I don't know how that works either. So, uh, hey, if you want to friend my, uh, find me on Facebook. Also, we can go back to MySpace. I'm kidding. Twitter is where you'll find me most of the time. I, I'm very active on there. So, uh, and of course, uh, purchase anything, uh, purchase. Sorry, uh, nobody buys anything anymore. Right. But uh, support my work somehow. By clicking on <laughs> By his clicking ads. on my, when you see someone stuck in a washing machine, that's me, baby. Click away. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys can follow me on Instagram and on X at Holly Randall. Um, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered to watch excellent podcasts like this one live and submit your questions like Polly and Dave did. Um, maybe we'll leave politics out of the next one. <laughs> We, didn't, we only touched on it at the end. We're, we're, we're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, of course, go to hollylinks.com for access to all of my podcast platforms. I have a whole fucking bunch of them. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Make sure that you wish Mike a happy birthday, even though this will come out a full week after his birthday is over. And I'll see you guys on the next one. <laughs> <laughs>